If you've owned investment property for some years, you're probably sitting on a ton of equity and a really low interest rate. And that makes it hard to know how to tap into that equity if you want to buy more real estate. I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Our guest today, Richard Advani, is a mortgage lender and real estate investor specializing in working with investors for over 16 years. He's also a real estate investor himself with nearly 20 rental properties across the country. Plus, he's a professional race car driver with the Formula Drift organization. And he's here with us today on The Real Well Show. Welcome, Richard. Thanks for having me again. All right. So there was a lot of excitement that the Fed was going to cut rates and that was going to affect mortgages and mortgages were going to come down. And that's not exactly what happened. So why, when the Fed just cut rates, have mortgages actually done the opposite and gone back up recently? Yeah. So I'm sure a lot of us noticed, uh, you know, and, 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 and it's interesting. I've had clients reaching out after the Fed lower their rates, you know, kind of touching base to see where mortgage rates are. And, and you know, as you're aware, and a lot of us are, uh, the bond market really priced in that dr Fed drop in advance. So leading up to the actual Fed's lowering the rates, mortgage rates had already dropped around half a percent. And, you know, as of about August, September, uh, we hit pretty much two-year lows on where mortgages were. And, um, you know, as soon as the Fed's lowers, lowered the rates, quite the opposite happened, right? The Treasury started rallying upwards and mortgage rates started rallying upwards, you know, kind of contrary to what everyone was expecting. And, um, you know, I know you probably know as much of this as I do, but there was a couple of reasons why, right? Firstly, much of the reduction in mortgage rates from the Fed's lowering rates had already happened leading up to the actual Fed drop. And number two is, you know, the Treasury bonds are really what affect mortgage rates, right? The 10-year Treasury bond. And um, as we get more and more, not only economic news, there's tons of geopolitical news as well, which kind of moves the gauge on that 10-year Treasury bond. And what we've seen is, you know, as um, a lot of these economic reports and jobs reports are coming out and showing that the economy is doing a little better than expected, um, that's in turn pushing up the treasury bonds and pushing up mortgage rates with it. It's kind of tough to say what's going to happen. Obviously, moving here, I think the general consensus is overall, as we move into the future, interest rates will come down. However, in the short term, we've seen them kind of swallow up much of the, 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 the reduction that they had in the past 60 days. Yeah, so the way I like to describe it is that the Fed is slow and they do a lot of announcing in advance, right? Like they basically give hints and signals to the bond market. And the bond market is fast, man. When they hear any word uttered by any Fed representative anywhere speaking, it they respond and the bond market responds to all kinds of geopolitical news, like you said, war or... Uh, what's happening in other countries economically. So with that environment, you're right. I mean, if the Fed is kind of hinting that they're going to cut rates, the m bond market reacts immediately before that happens. And that's what we saw. And then rates did go down a little bit. And I think it's because the jobs report right around September, I don't know if it was a September or August report, actually came in not so great. So with the rate cut and then some negative economic news, the bond yields went down. But since then, we have seen like not as many job losses, right? We're just not seeing those jobless claims. In fact, it was down this past month and, uh, and more jobs created than expected. So it's just this confusing place where nobody really knows what's going on or why the job market has been so resilient. I don't think anyone saw this coming. No, definitely not. And obviously, the elections are playing, I think, a role in in where the bond market, where the new what news is coming out as well. So, you know, I, I'm hopeful that you know as we move through the election, that things will start calming down. I think the general long term, medium to long term consensus are as rates are going to be trending downwards. They still are lower than you know where they've been the last year or two years, but unfortunately, they didn't kind of stay at that low that reprieve we had. I mean, you know, being able to get in the high fives 
uh, with investor loans with points and stuff. It lasted for like a week. And now it's obviously slowly and steadily moving up. But I would say not to fret. Um, you know, rates, I think, overall are going to slowly start trending downwards as we move into next year. And I, I don't know if we're going to get back to those threes and fours or even low fives in, in the near future. But as we've all seen, real estate has proved to be extremely resilient, even with mortgage payments doubling and tripling on homes. So Yeah, incredible. With that said, mortgage rates are better than they've been, right? So where, where are we today with investment property? Yeah, the good news is it's still very possible to get into the 6% range on rental properties, um, you know, without seller assistance, right? With seller assistance, you can still get into the high fives. Uh, what we've seen historically over the last year or so, I mean, rates had settled in the mid sevens for a little while for investors, right? So being able to get into the mid sixes, even with some points, I think is Still a great reprieve from from where where we've been, um, but not quite as low as we we hit you know a month month and a half ago. Um, the good thing is though is you know the sellers and most of the markets that you guys are working with are still being very aggressive on incentives for buyers to try to make up for the rate market. Um, as we all know, once rates as a whole do start moving down, that's probably going to drive up demand for the homes, right? So um, now is as good a time as any, especially with these builder incentives, um, to lock down the home before that demand increases. Uh, but the interesting thing is a lot of these incentivized rates that your markets are offering are, are even lower than you know, than what we experienced a month ago and probably lower than we're going to see in the market in the next couple of years. I think some of them under 4% even. Um, so it's still a good opportunity, of course. But uh, as a whole, um, rates have moved up from the bottoms we hit. And fingers crossed, as we move into next year, they'll, they'll level out again. Yeah, so for any of our listeners who don't really know what Richard's talking about, these are um, loans that we've been able to negotiate with builders who need to move inventory, you know, the, it's been tough for them to sell inventory because it, it costs a lot more to build a new home than sell an existing home. Although in some cases it's been about the same price, uh, in some cases, even cheaper to buy a new home, but builders have to sell a certain amount of homes every month. They can't just sit on it. They have loans and we've been able to work out and negotiate deals with them where instead of them discounting the price of the property, because that's, that really hurts a builder to discount the cost of a home because that means all the homes they they sell after that are going to be less. So they'd rather do things like give uh, upgrades or you know do something else give you, give the buyer something else besides discounting the home. So what we've been able to do is say, hey, take the money you would use to pay upgrades because we don't really need that as investors. We don't need a higher end kitchen or something. Um, instead, let's take that money and pay down the note. So we've really seen investors at Real Wealth get what th even 3 and a quarter percent interest rate. What what do you know what it is now that investors can get on new properties? I think they can still get those 3.75% rates with uh, some of your teams right now. A lot of those teams took advantage of the drop in rates a month ago and and incentivized this big chunk of money that's still available and still incentivized uh, for people that weren't actually able to to you know capture and lock in those lower rates. So the good news is with uh, the partners that Real Wealth is working with, they've actually locked in the rates on the higher level, right? To still make sure that us as investors can come in and have access to these lower rates and increased cash flow. So this to me is one of the best opportunities. And of course, our members at Real Wealth have been jumping all over it. We've had some of the strongest months ever in sales at Real Wealth because of this, because the property's cash flow. And then additionally, when you have a new property, the insurance rates are lower because they're built to hurricane standards. They're just built to better standards. And property taxes seem to be a little bit better as well. So we're seeing like really incredible cash flow on these brand new properties that rent immediately because tenants love a new property too. So it's been it's been a very popular product and a way for people to build their portfolio at a time when a lot of, a lot of other people have just, you know, stood still. Exactly. And once again as we discussed earlier, I think the last three years has been one of the biggest tests, I feel like, that the real estate market in general, the stress test, right, that it could have gone through in and, you know, 
what all of us expected was with interest rates doubling and tripling and house payments doubling and tripling that it would have a significant negative impact on the housing market. And um, granted, we all do and want more affordability and we need rates to come back down. But um, the real estate markets made it through an incredibly difficult three years, right? And, um, you know, house payments have doubled, tripled, but uh, house values have still gone up and min- or have maintained stable in most markets, which, you know, once again, was the opposite of what people expected. But it just really shows how, you know, the fundamental problem of supply and demand, you know, how strong that problem really exists, right? Even with payments doubling on homes, the house prices still remained very resilient. And that's because of the shortage of homes out there, you know, and, and um, I don't think it's a problem that's going to be fixed anytime soon. So a lot of people are sitting on a lot of home equity since prices have gone up and they're locked into low fixed rate debt. They don't want to get out of that. They don't want to get out of these low interest rate loans. So what do you think about HELOCs, specifically getting a a line of equity on an investment property? I would imagine that would be extremely expensive, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, the interest rates for equity lines on rental properties are extremely high. However, I think as investors, we need to look at the lost opportunity of not doing something and not staying active in real estate versus the the fear of losing that low interest rate, right, that we may have on a first mortgage. I actually did a webinar with you guys with Leah a couple months ago where we actually went in detail looking at what our options were, right? And I actually ran one of my own properties in, a por- in, in my portfolio that, you know, it's gone up significantly in value, um, but it's not really making tons of cash flow, right? It's in Texas. It's done very, very well, um, but it's break even. And I've got $140,000 equity locked in there. And what became very evident in running different examples, whether it was an equity line or whether it was a cash out loan or whether it was a 1031, what was very clear with whatever option that we ran and what the number said was two was better than one every single time. And the reason is, obviously, is, is we're all aware the beauty of real estate is participating in 100% of the growth of the asset with just putting 20 or 25 or 30% down, right? So, you know, what I ended up realizing was, and it was it was interesting, it was a really aha moment for me. I consider myself a very conservative investor. I've never cashed out, never done the 1031. Most of my portfolio is at 40, 50% LTV. And I was like patting myself on the back, you know, right? That's my conservative strategy. Well, in running these numbers for this example I was doing for you guys, I realized how much I really left on the table, right? Um, once again, two is better than one. Now, does that mean I need to max leverage everything? No. But could I have done some 1031s or pulled out 70% loan to value and and had another 40% more properties that were growing and and in the market? I definitely could have. And I realized uh, that I was probably a little too conservative and I've been too conservative. So, you know, to get back to your question, you know, does it make sense to do an equity line or even a cash out? Um, Yes, I think it will. Two, like I said, is better than one. Finding the right deal that will still generate cash flow, of course, and cover that equity line payment can be tough. Um, But I would urge all of you guys, you know, look at the amount of equity that you're not putting to work and model the numbers with your counselors at Real Wealth. And they'll be able to see, hey, okay, these are the numbers that you're generating. Here's your 10-year outlook on what you have now versus saying maybe doing a 1031. And here's your 10-year look, ten year outlook on these two or three properties that you'll have instead. And um, I was very closed off to that myself. Like I said, I'll buy new construction, set it, forget it, never want to refi, never want to sell. <laughs> um, and I realized I was too conservative, you know, and everyone's strategy is going to be different. The right strategy depends on your comfort level. And um, I think I got too comfortable being comfortable um, and, you know, should have uh, definitely pushed out to get more. Uh, but the hard part with equity lines is getting over that nine or ten percent rate, right? Um, a yeah. second lien position loan is is tough in this market. Yeah, I'd probably be more apt to just refi or, um, yeah, refi the property, t- do a cash out. That'll be a better interest rate, and um, tap into the equity that way and reinvest. But it is it's so interesting. Numbers don't lie, right? And when you can really take the numbers and see if I just sat here with this property, I'm going to do fine. You know, it's just going to be a slow growth deal, 
But if I take that money out now, you're doubling that. And it all depends on your strategy, right? It's all about what are you trying to achieve in the end? And if it is to have a certain number of properties by the time you retire that are taking care of you during retirement, you're going to want more than less, right? You're going to want to have those paid off as much as possible by the time you retire. If it's really for cash flow today, maybe maybe it doesn't make as much sense. It just kind of depends. But did you run the numbers that way? Cash flow versus appreciation? I did. I ran it both ways. And what was interesting and in going back to my, you know, Austin property as an example, I bought it at 200,000 break even. It's worth 350 today, still break even because even though rents went up, property taxes went up. And here I am now, I owe 150 on it and it's worth, you know, 330. So I've got all this tied up equity and I'm break even now. And I realized mission accomplished on that property, right? Uh, it's grown, it's done very well, it's appreciated, but now is the time to reanalyze, you know, that investment in the portfolio. And what I realized was I could turn that into two properties that were actually cash flow positive, right? Um, and I bought that property to knowing, hey, it didn't have a lot of positive, but there was a lot of upside and growth, mm -hmm. which I experienced. And I think the lesson for me there was that I need to continually evaluate my real estate portfolio and analyze it. And, you know, I only analyzed new deals. And once they pushed in and, you know, properties I've owned 10, 12 years, I just stopped analyzing. They're doing well, rents have gone up. Well, am I effectively managing my portfolio to the best of not only my ability, but to get the best returns, even with my conservative um, investment philosophy, right? And I realize I'm not. You know, 60, 70 percent LTV still is conservative. You know, being at 45, 50, um, you know, I, I think wasn't the right strategy for me. You know, I've kind of evolved my strategy. And the cool thing is it started with, you know, your team reaching out to me saying, hey, do you want to do a webinar on this? And I was like, yeah, I'll run the numbers. I'll use one of my own properties as an example. And, you know, two weeks out as I'm running the numbers and running the numbers, getting ready, I was like, so like, like, oh, my God, like, <laughs> I should have done this a little differently than I have. You know. It's so true. It's so easy to set and forget. Um, as you yeah. know, our our partner, our uh, property team in Dallas, the the woman who we have the, our um, single family rental fund with, she promotes this all the time. She's like, don't sit on equity, keep putting it to work. Whether that means getting the, however you can get the money out of it, a cash out refi, a HELOC, selling it and 1031 wanting one property into two or three. Uh, she says that is absolutely the fastest way to build wealth. And she has, she's up to, I don't know, $45 million portfolio in just, I don't know, eight years or something. It's incredible. Wow. So in the beginning, when she told me this plan, I thought she was a bit crazy and like a little too aggressive, but it's obviously worked. So I love that. All right. Well, if anyone listening wants to learn more about how to get great loans, Richard Advani is one of our uh, preferred lenders at Real Wealth. You can go to realwealth.com and click on the resources and you'll find him. You've worked with so many of our of our clients. And if you could just share the importance of working with a lender who understands investment property. Yeah, I mean, it, it's unquantifiable. I think that the biggest thing is the lost opportunity that people have, right? Um, you may have been turned down at lenders or they may have told you, hey, you can only buy two properties a year based on your income. Um, whereas, you know, we have the tools and the knowledge to where, you know, we can help people buy an infinity number of properties per year, assuming you have the down payment, right? Um, and I think dealing, it's not only about the lender in front of you and what I know, it's about what my team is used to working, right? The type of deals that I bring in. And when you deal with someone, no matter how good of a job they've done helping you buy your primary home, but when you sit down with them, it's not only about their knowledge as it relates to investor guidelines. Once again, it's about their underwriting and their processors. And when they see an investor who's just bought five properties three months ago, wants to buy two more, and all they normally look at is this primary home files, right? The underwriters don't know the limits of the guidelines that are available for investors. They only know what they know, right? What's in their wheelhouse. And that's where we've seen a lot of misinformation and a lot of opportunity left on the table uh, for investors. But there's also the small things. And I think, you know, you guys are very good about working with the right partners. And I know I'm one of those right partners. Um, but the knowledge that the right lender has and that has worked with investors, I've saved investors 
tons and tons and tons of money just because of my knowledge base in dealing with investors. And I'll give you an example, you know, having an investor call in that's owned a property for 14 years and they wanted to do a cash out refi and invested in their LLC and all this stuff. And, you know, I end up in conversation talking to them and I realized that, hey, when you transfer this to an LLC, your property's going to be reassessed. And the tax rate they were paying because the property was 15 years old was so low that they were at the closing table with another lender, right? And they called me to do a deal check and see if I can do better. And I brought to their attention that their property taxes were going to go up by $800 a month. And the cash flow on the property that they thought they were making was going to be negative. And they never would have known this till two months later, till it was too late. And I said, don't do the transaction with them or with me, because this is what's going to happen, right? And they could only qualify for an LLC loan at the time. So once again, I, I think more than the things I could, as someone can proactively know, it's the things that they don't know and the lost opportunity. Um, the good news is, you know, Real Wealth works with, you know, some of the best lenders in the industry. All of us are investor specific. Um, so I think there's a huge, huge, huge benefit to working with the right lender. Not to mention the normal stuff, right? The loan's going to go through smoother. It's going to be easier and all of that. Um, but at the end of the day, we're going to help you make more money by giving you tips and tricks and kind of creating the path that um, a normal retail primary home lender just wouldn't have the wherewithal to do or the knowledge um, to offer you, you know, these eggs, these these Easter eggs that are going to save you tons of money in, in your investing career. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of having a really good mortgage broker. Don't just go down the street to your local bank and think that they're going to help you with your investment property, especially if they've never owned investment property and don't, don't do those kinds of loans. You just won't get the help you need. All right, Richard. Well, thank you so much for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show once again. Thank you for the opportunity as always. All right. And thank you all for joining us here on The Real Wealth Show. Again, if you want to get Richard's information, just go to realwealthshow.com, click on the resources tab, and you'll see the drop down. He's worked with so many of our investors and can still get you those investment loans under 4%. It's crazy. And you're not even the one who has to pay the points. The seller does. So it's a wonderful situation. All right. Thank you all. And we'll see you next time. I'm Kathy Fedke, and this has been The Real Wealth Show. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.